it's 2022 and you still have to unlock your iPhone with Face ID like an animal or Touch ID, passcode, password, whatever. All just different flavors of animal. Why? Because authentication is still active. Your iPhone is locked until such time as you jump through a biometric or input field hoop to unlock it. Never mind if you're wearing a mask and sunglasses or gloves or your finger is damp or your hands are full or you're in a rush, like hitting that subscribe button so we can build the best community in tech together, rush. So what do you do? If you're Apple, maybe you destroy Face ID, at least as a single point of active authentication failure. Not with Touch ID, but with something just way, way better. Magic ID, no, that's a terrible name, like Tiberius. Smart ID, let's go with Smart ID. But to appreciate how ridiculously good Smart ID would be, we first have to appreciate how ridiculously bad everything else has been so far. Starting with the OG iPhone and nothing. Well, effectively nothing really, because swipe to unlock, just so you didn't accidentally butt dial someone thanks to having an active multi-touch screen in your pants or bag was effectively nothing. But if you wanted to, you could enable a four digit passcode to keep the riffraff out. You know, the people who would literally be tweeting pooping if you ever left your phone at the bar. But as time went on and the contents of our phones became more and more private, more important and valuable, Apple began to take authentication more seriously. So Apple bought a company called Authentic and began working on Touch ID, a biometric fingerprint identity scanner that would make authentication way, way more convenient. And more on that in a minute. But basically, Apple figured if they made it way easier to unlock, they could also make it more attractive to lock. Not only get more people to enable a passcode, but a stronger six digit passcode or a damn near adamantium strong password, even add the option for auto delete after 10 failures. But passcodes are still active. Passwords are actively user hostile. You have to remember them and enter them correctly. And that takes time, especially when you're trying to do it repeatedly and under stress, it can take a lot of time. And accessing our own phones, it shouldn't be a job, much less a full-time job. And we shouldn't be working for the machine the machine should be working for us. So Touch ID, starting with the iPhone 5S. You place your finger on the home button, or now the power button on the recent iPads non-pro and Macs, where it's compared to the math of your previously registered fingerprint. And if they match, releases an authentication token to iOS, even approve things like Apple Pay transactions. But of course, Touch ID won't work if you're wearing gloves or if the moisture of your finger is different enough from when you registered your print, like if you just washed your hands or sweated them up in a workout, or if you burned or cut yourself. And it's nowhere nearly as secure as a long, strong, unique password anyway, but it's just so much more convenient, especially if you're unlocking your iPhone, never mind several times an hour, but dozens and dozens of times an hour. And while Apple bought a company called PrimeSense, the company that helped design the original Xbox Kinect sensor and eventually used it to build Face ID, which has replaced Touch ID on every iPhone except the SE, there have been persistent rumors about Apple adding Touch ID back, specifically an in-display sensor, super specifically as a large acoustic and or ultrasonic sensor that would cover most of the bottom of the display. The only problem is in button or in display, either way, it's still active you still have to put your finger down for it to unlock or authorize you every single time, which might not sound like much, but it's still moments from your day, slices from your life, and it's still you working for the machine, not the other way around. So face ID, starting with the iPhone 10, you raise or bump it to wake, triggering the front facing camera array to just bathe your face in infrared light. But because unlike fingerprints, our hairstyles, facial hair, even fashions can and do change. It uses neural networks to match and it's just constantly updating the matching process to keep up with us. Now, previously, Face ID needed all the data from a triangle around your eyes, nose, and mouth to ensure a secure enough match. But with masks hiding our noses and mouths for much of the last two years, basically the opposite of the Batman, recent betas have lent more heavily on data from around our eyes, which makes it a little less secure but offers the convenience of Face ID even with the mask on. But even discounting the masks, OG Face ID won't work if sunlight is blinding the camera system, if you're wearing infrared blocking sunglasses, or it can't see your eyes and attention mode is on. While new optional Face ID is fine with masks, but requires special training for glasses and won't work with pretty much any sunglasses or fuller face protections like Canadians, and yes, the Batman might wear for half the year or more. So. Sure, 
at its best, Face ID is even more secure than Touch ID, unless you're dealing with an evil twin situation. At its best, it's even more convenient because it can unlock while you're just picking up your phone, which can make it feel almost transparent, almost not active, even though it still totally is. And anytime you're off angle enough to have to pick it up or wake it up first, you know how active it is. Like Matrix Resurrected, you're still working for the machine. So what else could Apple use? Well, how about Voice ID? Nuance, which was part of the original backend for Siri, offered Voice ID services, including for banking apps, but it just never really took off. Apple started doing basic Voice ID for hands-free Siri with the iPhone 6S, adding registration for it in the Setup Buddy experience. It used the always-on capabilities of the Sensor Fusion Hub in the original M series of motion coprocessors that got integrated back into the A series and beefed up considerably over the years. Previously, it would have to make a network connection to Apple's servers at that point to parse just any and all requests. But as of last year, Apple is handling local requests on device and only handing off to the servers for specifically internet related requests. Apple even added multi-user voice ID support to the HomePod. So you could ask Siri to read out your messages instead of your partners or your kids and just all the potential hilarity and embarrassment that may cause. It's okay enough for basic disambiguation for a shared HomePod or iPhone out in public, but not for security against the whole wide world. Certainly not for my voice is my passport, verify me. Plus, if you get a bad cold or lose your voice, it can all just fall apart quick. And speaking a code word is as active as typing a password anyway. But I'm building to something here. Last year, Apple added full-on gain analysis to the iPhone. It's for health and preventative therapeutic reasons, not for security, but it can still tell you how you walk. Is it granular enough to tell your walk apart from somebody else's? like security-based gate analysis systems work? I have no idea. And if you twist your ankle or tweak your back, it can be a huge problem. But it's absolutely, potentially, another source for biometric data. But here's the thing, biometric data isn't the only possibility. Authentication typically breaks down to three factors. Something you know, like a password, something you are, like a fingerprint, and or something you have, like a trusted object. The problem with traditional trusted objects is that they were single factor dumb Bluetooth dongles. So anybody could just grab the dongle or relay the Bluetooth and effectively become you. But Apple already has a really smart, really secure trusted object with the Apple Watch. Same with all the other signals that can be used to pick up and establish and match our patterns, like time. For example, when you're usually awake versus asleep. Location, when you're usually at home or at work or these days working from home, and behavior in general, like when you usually do all the usual things that you do usually. And that might just spark some privacy paranoia alarm bells, but Apple's just as paranoid here. So it's restricted to on-device only for your own benefit and with that very narrow app recommendation use case as well, which currently does not include anything even remotely close to authentication because as signals go, these are all just incredibly weak, at least by themselves. But what if they were part of something more, like something threshold more? Okay, so imagine this. You go to use your iPhone and it's just unlocked. That's it, that's all. But totally not all, because it took a hell of a lot of work to be that simple. Every time you spoke, your iPhone captured a snippet of your voice. Every time you moved in front of the camera, it caught a glimpse of your face. Every time you touched the bottom of the display, it registered a partial print. Every time you carried it around, it tracked a little bit of your gait. Nothing that on its own would ever be anywhere nearly enough to actively authenticate you. But when all pieced together met some predetermined threshold of trust that just resulted in your iPhone being passively unlocked whenever you wanted to use it. And maybe, sure, you could choose how strict that threshold had to be, like low for when you're at home, high when you're out and about, and password only when you're entering a particularly sketchy situation. But maybe location is part of it as well, and time, and behavior, and even wearing your trusted watch. All of those things could lower or raise that threshold of trust. And if anything happens, if you're wearing a mask and gloves and have a cold and you take your watch off while you're out skiing at some mountain you've never been to before and you fall below that threshold of trust, then, only then, does your iPhone challenge you for a full active authentication. Otherwise, when you're well above the threshold, you're just set, you're good to go, which could also be a super high threshold, like, multi-factor face and touch and voice 
and watch high. I'm talking a total win for both security and convenience because otherwise the authentication is totally passive but also totally persistent, all still on device for only our benefit, privacy by design, never shared with Apple or anyone else, but all working for you. The machine finally working for you, not the other way around, not like an animal. Smart ID or magic ID, womp womp. But given everything Apple's doing, everything I just went over, I have to believe they're working towards this or something like this. Hell, given Apple's fully integrated model from silicon to software, they're pretty much uniquely positioned to be working towards this, to give us authentication peace in our time. And if you wanna help them get there, check out algorithms, neural networks, and machine learning courses on today's sponsor, Brilliant. Basically, everything that the next generation of authentication is gonna be based on, but also math, science and computer science, physics, quantum mechanics, game theory, cryptocurrency, and more. Because Brilliant is the online interactive STEM learning platform with a growing catalog of courses specifically crafted to help you learn concepts by working through them yourself in visual hands-on ways. And I cannot stress this enough. I wish school had been like this because it would have just so, so much better. For example, have you ever wanted to learn how coding works, but were put off by overly complicated traditional computer programming courses? Well, Brilliant has actual fun, interactive challenges that let you shift blocks of pseudocode around receive immediate feedback and get results. You feel like you're just having fun solving puzzles, but the whole time, the whole time you're learning how algorithms work. And once you know that, coding becomes way less intimidating. And who knows, maybe you'll unlock the whole future of Magic ID for all of us. Because here's the thing, everyone, everyone starts somewhere and you can get started right now, today, for free. Just visit brilliant.org slash Renee or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Just click the button on the screen or go to brilliant.org slash Renee Ritchie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting up this playlist for more, way more on the future of key Apple technologies like this. Just hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.